Praise the Lord. Your voice looks cold. I said, Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone to our Bible study tonight. I pray the Lord will penetrate every heart and the word will enrich every life in Jesus' name. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Father, we thank you for this hour. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for what you've done already in every life. Thank you for bringing us into the kingdom. And as we come before your word today, we're asking that your spirit will take the word and apply it to every heart, every life in Jesus' name. We pray that none of us will go back home empty-handed, but your word will touch every life, reveal your truth to everyone, and you show us the crucified Christ and all the benefits of the crucified Christ in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. As you know, if you have been following us in the reading of the studies of the scriptures, and you have been studying with us every Monday, here is the fourth study in the first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians. Already we've gone through chapter 1. And in chapter 1, we've seen that the Lord was talking to the people who were brethren. They were called they were called to be saints. They were called into the kingdom of God. And they had part in the salvation that Christ himself has provided for everyone. Now today, as we come to chapter 2, we're looking at verses 1 through to 8. Look at your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, reading from verse 1. It says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with the excellency of speech or of wisdom. It says, I was declaring unto you the testimony of God. It's going back to the time he came to Corinth the first time. And he came to those Corinthians and he said, I came to you. I did not come with excellency of speech. I did not come with human wisdom. I did not come with the philosophies of the philosophers. He came wanting to bring the gospel unto them. And then he tells us the attitude in which he came, the disposition with which he came. He says in verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He said, when I was coming unto you, to declare the gospel, the gospel of salvation, to declare, declare the gospel, the gospel of the grace of God. When I was coming to you at Corinth to declare to you the gospel that will save your soul, he said, I made up my mind. I determined within myself that I will not come to you knowing a Paul, or Apollos, or Sivas, or any personality, I wanted to see Jesus and him crucified, lift up Jesus and him crucified, preach Jesus and him crucified, exalt Jesus and him crucified only. And then he says in verse 3, he said, and I was with you when he eventually came unto you, I was with you in weakness and in fear, and in much trembling. Isn't it something to hear Paul the Apostle say, I came to you. And then he said, I came with fear and trembling. What kind of fear? We'll see that in the study. He said, and, and my speech in verse 4, and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. He said, I came full of the Spirit of God. I came to declare. I came to demonstrate the power of the Spirit of God. I came to demonstrate all those gifts of the Spirit and the grace of the Spirit of God that will move you away from where you are and get you to where you ought to be in Christ. And then he says in verse 5, his intention. 
and his purpose when he said that your face should not rest, should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. If there's anything we need to think about today, is that your faith as a learner, your faith as a member of the church, your faith as somebody that wants to know the Lord in a higher way, in a deeper way, your faith will not stand in the wisdom of man or wisdom of men, but your faith will stand in the power of God. How be it will speak wisdom among them which are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, that come to nothing, but will speak the wisdom of God in a mystery among even the hidden wisdom which God has ordained before the world uh, before the world unto our glory in verse 8 which none of the princes of this world knew for had they known that wisdom they would not have crucified the Lord of glory those are the verses we're looking at today. The topic is proclaiming the crucified Christ with the Spirit's wisdom. Preaching, declaring, proclaiming, explaining, exhorting the, about the crucified Christ with the Spirit's wisdom. The challenge in Corinth was that they depended on the wisdom of the Greeks, the wisdom of the philosophers, the wisdom of the heathen, the wisdom of the people that were not saved. And they wanted to bring their secular wisdom into the church and they wanted to apply their, uh, their philosophical wisdom to the word of God. And it did not work. And it will not work because that kind of wisdom will not lead them to the experience of the grace of God, of the goodness of God. I will not lead them to the experience that will take them to heaven. That's why he said he determined not to know anything among them. Of all those people that stood heads and shoulders above the rest of the gentle world in their philosophy and in their wisdom, he wanted to declare the wisdom of God that leads us to salvation, proclaiming the crucified Christ with the Spirit's wisdom. We're looking at the passage under three perspectives. Number one, the declaration of the whole word of God. Every word of God is important. Important to the sinner, important to the saints, important to the church, important to every soul. And all the areas of our lives are all covered by the word of God. So if we only preach a part, and we do not preach another part, we're losing something. We're missing something. And so when Paul, the apostle, came, he declared the whole word of God. Point number one then is the declaration of the whole word of God. Point number two, the demonstration of the wholesome wonders of the gospel. The gospel came in power. The gospel came with authority. And Paul the Apostle said, I came in the power of the Spirit of God. And he came to demonstrate the wholesome, the healthy, the wonderful, the life-transforming wonders of the gospel. Number three, point number three is the depreciation of hollow wisdom of the godless. The hollow, superficial worthless wisdom of the godless depreciating that putting that down and exalting the lord himself let's come back to point number one point number one is the declaration of the whole word of god what are you doing from chapter two again first corinthians chapter two reading from verse one it says and i 
I, Paul, and I, born again, and I, saved, you couldn't be a preacher of the gospel if you had not been saved by the gospel. And I, Paul, a servant of the Lord by the will of God. You couldn't preach the gospel if your mind was not to serve God with all humility. And you are a servant of God, appointed by God, approved of God. And I, he was talking about, and I consecrated Paul to the ministry. He was consecrated to the ministry of the word of God. You couldn't serve the Lord. You couldn't preach the gospel. You couldn't be what the Lord wanted you to be if you were not saved and sanctified and spirit filled and submissive and surrender to the Lord and if you were not so committed to the Lord entirely consecrated unto the Lord that you wanted nothing but the glory of God alone and I brethren he was talking to brethren there were problems among them at Corinth but they were brethren there were divisions among them that should not be but they were brethren these were people who had been called by the gospel and called by the grace of god and called into the kingdom and they knew the lord although there were some imperfections to iron out in their lives they were brethren and i brethren when i came to you i came not with the excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. You know what he's saying? He's saying when a father wants to talk to his children, it doesn't come with philosophical argument and with highbrow kind of vocabulary and then to have this structure and this structure the father what knows where he wants the children to be he knows where he wants the family to be and he comes not to the excellency of speech it's not coming in as if you know he's uh, keeping to a kind of structure by the philosophers he said i came I was interested in you getting saved. I was interested in you coming out of darkness and coming into the light. And therefore, I came not with excellency of speech at all to declare unto you the testimony of the Lord. For I determined, for I determined that not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. You know why many evangelists do not get souls to the kingdom of God? They do not determine before the evangelism that they will know nothing about anything, about anyone. All they want to know is Christ crucified. You know why many pastors and many preachers don't get souls into the kingdom of God because they are not focused on Christ crucified. They are not as determined as Paul the Apostle saying, I want to know nothing in the congregation about anyone. All I want to know is Christ crucified. You know why many people who come to church do not get much in the word of God? And they don't get the transforming power in the world to transform their lives and to change them all through. You know why? Because they don't determine, they don't have that determination that I'm going to church today. I'm going to the Bible study today. I'm going to the revival hour today. I want to know nothing about anybody. All I want to know is Christ and Him crucified. You know, there are people that come to church and they are, they are lo looking at that is not well placed, that is not all right. The singers are not singing well, or the singers have done very well today, or the person who is making an announcement. All they're looking at, they're looking at other things and they don't leave the people to do what they ought to do in the Lord but Paul the apostle said whether I'm hearing the word or preaching the word I'm declaring the word I'm imparting the knowledge of the word of God unto the people all I want to know is Christ and him crucified 
it will do you a world of good it will do me a world of good it will do us as a church a world of good as you come to the church as you come to your bible as you come to listen to any preacher your own preacher in your local church or you want to listen to your state overseer your region overseer or you are listening to us from the headquarters church here that you want to know nothing except christ and him crucified and then he said and i was with you i was with you you have to be with the people if you're going to preach to them if you're going to impart their lives you cannot be separated from the people in your mind in your disposition you, you cannot be afraid of the people and then you cannot get near you're afraid of the people you're preaching to you're not doing any good unto them and neither will they receive the word he said i was with you and yet he said in weakness and in fear and in much trembling the declaration of the whole word of god three things here number one paul's declaration of the word in corrupt corinth corinth was corrupt corinth was sinful corinth was away from god far away from god and yet paul the apostle was sent by god that he should declare the totality of the word of god unto the corinthians how did he do that the declaration of the word unto the corinthians we're coming to acts of the apostles chapter 18 acts of the apostles chapter 18 and here we're reading from verse 8 acts chapter 18 and we're reading from verse 8 it says in verse 8 and crispus the chief ruler of the synagogue believed on the lord with all his heart and many of the corinthians when paul the apostle went to corinth and he preached the word of salvation the word of repentance the word of of redemption and the word that transformed their lives and took them out of sin and brought them to the savior out of darkness and he brought them to the light many believed when they heard the word of god and they were baptized look at verse 9 it says then speak the word to paul in the night by a vision be not afraid but speak be not afraid but speak you remember he had said when i was with you i was with you in weakness in fear and trembling and now the lord said paul i've sent you i've appointed you i brought you to corinth and as a goal there is a purpose there is something to achieve therefore fear not but speak and hold not thy peace look at the assurance the lord gave him in verse 10 for i am with thee you've been in other places i was with you you see get to other places i'll be with you and how and now at corinth i am with you and then he goes on to say and no man shall search on thee to hurt thee can i be good amen there when the lord is with you he has appointed you he has anointed you he has put you in place and where you are is at the very center of where god wants you to be in ministry it says i am with you if he is with you satan can do nothing persecutors can do nothing all those opposers can do nothing the word of god will come out of you and penetrate their hearts and lead them to salvation and lead them to christian experiences in jesus name and look at this for i have much people in this city 
whatever their philosophical ideas i have much people in this city whatever their idolatry as they were taken to dump idols i have much people in this city and with that assurance it declared unto them the whole counsel of god acts chapter 20 we're reading from verse 26 acts chapter 20 reading from verse 26 wherefore i take you to record this day that i am pure from the blood of all men everywhere paul the apostle went he wanted to be clear from the blood of all men he didn't want to get to the judgment seat of god eventually and somebody will point at him paul you came to a city you came to Corinth. You didn't tell us. You didn't tell me. I saw you. You counseled me. And you didn't tell me that this past and this lifestyle and this kind of action would lead me to hell. You did not tell me you are guilty of my blood. Paul the Apostle said they couldn't say that at Corinth. They couldn't say that in Ephesus. They couldn't say that in Philippi. They couldn't say that anywhere. Why? Look at verse 27. For I have not charged to declare unto you all the counsel of God, because I did not neglect my duty. I did not shirk my responsibility. I didn't look at the faces of the people, at the actions of the people, and then I became so afraid I couldn't talk about salvation, saved by grace, through faith. I couldn't talk about follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall save the Lord. I couldn't tell them everything I ought to tell them because I was afraid. No, not at all. He said, for I have not shared to declare unto you all. No section of the church, no section of the kingdom, no section of Christendom will say, Paul, you didn't tell us, I did not shun to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, in verse 28, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, has made you preachers, as many you pastors, then he says to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. That's what he did. He declared the whole counsel of God, even at Corinth, as corrupt as they were, as sinful as they were as idolatrous as they were, as evil as they were, as resistant as they were. He declared unto them the whole counsel of God. Come back to First, uh, first Corinthians chapter 2. We're looking at verse 2 now. The priceless determination without wavering concerning Christ crucified. The priceless determination without wavering concerning Christ crucified. We're looking at verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. It says, For I determined not to know anything among you, save that he is except Jesus Christ and him crucified. There was a church that had a good church building. And at the front, at the top of the door of that church outside, they put the words, we preach Christ crucified. But then they had an ivy tree. That's the kind of tree that grows. And the branches will come over the walls. 
And in no time at all, the branches covered the world crucified. So instead of having we preach Christ crucified, the word crucified, the last word was covered. All that remained were preach Christ. He omitted, and in that church inside, they're taking away the crucifixion and the shedding of the blood of the Lamb. And outside, the ivy tree had covered the word crucified. Just Christ as a good man, Christ as a good teacher, Christ as a social worker, Christ as a healer, the redemption of the, from the crucifixion had been taken away. But the tree kept on growing, and then it covered again the word Christ. And when people were passing by, all you could see would be, would preach. Christ crucified had been taken away. We preach. And then they could now tell stories. They could now emphasize tradition. And they were no more preaching Christ, exalting Christ, lifting up Christ, making Christ, making the people to know Christ is Savior. Christ is sanctifier, Christ is healer, and Christ is the baptizer in the Holy Ghost, and Christ is a perfect example, and Christ is the coming king. Eventually, the tree kept on growing, and it, uh, you know, brushed up the word, covered the word, preached. And so all you could see now, we, they were just there. Social gathering, we. Intimacy, we. And the purpose of the church had now been totally erased and cancelled. I pray that no branch and no tree will cover everything we ought to preach about Christ in Jesus' name. And whether we have a tree growing or no tree growing, we should look at what we're doing. We preach Christ crucified. And here, that's why Paul said, when I came to you, I determined I will know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I, as I said, every preacher ought to have that in mind. When you come to church, I don't want to know the rich men. I don't want to know the philosophers. I don't want to know the highly placed. I don't want to know this or that. All I want to know is Christ crucified. I don't want to know the people that have earthly wisdom, earthly skill, earthly power. I don't want to know those who are in the offices of the world who control things, the people that are able to say we stand in authority. All we want to know in the church Christ crucified. And then when you are coming to the church, it should not matter to you who is standing on the pulpit, a Paul, an Apollos, a Savas, a Timothy, a Titus, a Silas. All you want to know is that whoever is there, he declares unto us Christ crucified. Is my friend there? Is my persecutor there? Is uh, my family there? Is this one there? Is this not one there? That's not the important thing. What's important to you is we want to have and we want to know and we want to be intimate with Christ crucified. I determined not to know anything among you except Christ, Jesus Christ, and him crucified. Uh, the reason for that is that salvation is only in Christ. A sanctification only in Christ. The power of the Holy Ghost only in Christ. And the great and precious promises that the Lord has given to us only in Christ. We're looking at Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, we're reading from verse 12. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, reading from verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And if the salvation of the people is the most important thing, and Christ by his crucifixion, Christ by his atonement, 
Christ by sacrifice is the only one that can give us that salvation. That's why the preacher ought to come and declare unto us Christ and him crucified. If Jesus Christ is the only one that can give us full salvation, that can give us full redemption, that can give us sanctification, that can give us in part unto us the very righteousness of God. If Christ is the one that can make us righteous and make us holy, make us acceptable to God, if there is no other way, if Christ is the only way, then the people who speak to us, who preach to us, should know nothing and should discern nothing except Christ and Him crucified. And for you, if salvation is the most important thing to you, the reason why you come to church, the reason why you are deep alive, and the reason why you come to study the Bible with us, if the salvation of God is what's important, if heaven is what's important, if holiness is what's important, if redemption is what's important, it should be the determination of your heart. I want to know nothing in that church except Christ and Him crucified. And if you are going to any other church, church as you go to that church what you should determine to know I about their music that's not the most important I about their prayer that's not the most important I about their form of worship that's not the most important Christ saves Christ sanctifies Christ heals and Christ is the all in all for us it should be your mind as you come to this church, as you go to any other church, you want to know nothing among the people in that denomination except him crucified. That's why it says there's no other name given among men whereby we can be saved, whereby we can be sanctified, whereby we can be healed, whereby we can be delivered. There is no other name except the name of Jesus. He is the foundation and he is the provider of salvation, entire salvation, full salvation, final salvation for us. That's why we concentrate on him, Christ crucified. Let's come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we're looking at verse 3. It says, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. When you read that for the first time, you're surprised, Paul. How can it be? That Paul will go anywhere. That God, Paul will stand and preach the word. And then he will say, I was with you. And you know what? There was weakness. There was fear. There was trembling. Please understand. He wasn't afraid of persecution or the persecutors. Never. He wasn't afraid of the people or the problems they might cause never he wasn't afraid of the priesthood and of the princes in that town never he is the same person that said you put on the whole armor of god for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this world of this present age he is the one that said that even his life he did not count dear unto himself that he might finish his course with joy and the ministry that the lord has put in his hand what they was he afraid of? Because the scripture is still there when it says, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. There were philosophers there, as we have read in chapter 1. And there were people that brought the wisdom of the world. He was afraid they might depend on their philosophy and reject the principles of the gospel. He was afraid for them. He was coming to them. God has much people in that place. 
but I hope their philosophy will not hinder them. I hope their wisdom, worldly wisdom, will not hinder them. I hope their tradition will not hinder them. He was afraid for them, not afraid for himself. He told the king, he said, if they are charging me, let them bring the accusation. If I am wrong, I am not afraid to die. He wasn't afraid of the people. He wasn't afraid of the persecution, but he was afraid for them. Let me show you. Look at Philippians chapter 2. And here we're reading from verse 12. Philippians chapter 2. We're reading from verse 12. The kind of fear and trembling that ought to be in every life. It says in Philippians chapter 2 verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, that's my beloved brethren, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Look at this now. Look at this. Walk out your own salvation with somebody there. Tell me. Say it aloud. Say it everything. Walk out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He was afraid for their salvation. Would they get saved? Would they remain saved? Would they abide in salvation? Will the philosophers and their philosophies come to destabilize them? To make them afraid? I'm laboring on them. I want to preach the gospel to them in fullness. And I'm going to them in the power, in the demonstration of the Spirit of God. Will they walk out their salvation with fear and trembling? Will they accept the word? Will they receive the word? And will they be looking at Christ and Christ alone and Christ crucified? Or will they be looking at other people, other philosophies, other ideas, other traditions and will the tradition take them away from the foundation of the gospel he said i am afraid of you that's what he told the galatians i'm afraid of you christ was evidently crucified among you but the way you are now you are going to circumcision you are going to tradition and you are having this and having that i am coming to you now i am afraid of you and i'm i'm traveling in birth again for you that's what he made when he said he was in a fear and he was in trembling and for you as a child of god never tremble before the corinthians they can do nothing christ said the lord said i am with you he'll be with you till the end in jesus name Never be afraid of the person, of the personalities of the Corinthians because greater is he that is in us than he that is in Corinth or in any other city or in the world. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never abandon you. And no man will set on you to hurt you in Jesus' name. And when you're persecuted, stand and look face to face at your persecutors. Don't say, Paul, the apostle said, I was in weakness, I was trembling, I was afraid, and here is my persecutor now. I cannot look up, look up, and be like a conqueror. You'll be a conqueror in Jesus' name. If the persecutor overcomes you, how are you if you compromise because of the persecutor are you going to make it to heaven i will make it in jesus name i said i will make it in jesus name and when there's any problem when there's any challenge don't don't tremble before the challenge and don't tremble before the whatever it is stand by faith above all taking the shield of faith wherewith he shall be able to quench tell me all the fiery darts of the wicked one you will overcome in jesus name but as you look at your salvation you walk out your salvation with fear and trembling 
when there is temptation, don't be overconfident. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. When there's any thought, any idea, maybe I shouldn't go to church today, I shouldn't read my Bible today, I shouldn't pray today. When trial is there, and when that trial is coming up like the flood of Noah, and it's going to swallow you up, that's the time to wait upon the Lord. Don't be overconfident. There will be fear and trembling, and you walk out your faith, you walk out your salvation, you walk out your redemption and you walk out your victory with fear and trembling you will overcome in Jesus name point number two now is the demonstration of the wholesome wonders of the gospel the demonstration of the wholesome wonders of the gospel we're coming to first Corinthians chapter 2 and I'm reading here from verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, of Corinthian wisdom, of heathenic wisdom, of the Gentiles' wisdom, of the unsaved man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith the faith that gets us saved that your faith the faith that gets us sanctified that your faith the faith that makes us stable and standing and steadfast that your faith the faith that makes you to possess all the promises of god that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. The demonstration of the wholesome wonders of the gospel. Look at three things there. Number one, the futility of worldly wisdom in preaching the gospel. The futility of worldly wisdom in preaching the gospel. Look at the first part of verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of my wisdom. You remember Paul? He was Saul. When he was Saul, he was a Pharisee. And he knew the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. But the light of the Spirit of God had not shone on the Old Testament that he knew. He knew all the reaching laws. He knew all the oral laws. He knew he had the carnal wisdom and the earthly wisdom and the devilish wisdom to get anybody into trouble. He knew what to say. He knew how to say it to convince anybody that the righteous is so righteous, that good is evil that the holy is unholy, that the followers of Christ who are not following circumcision, that they were wrong. He had that carnal, human, devilish, earthly, religious, traditional wisdom. But now he came to the Lord and he repented of all his sins and he repented of old covenant carnal wisdom. The wisdom that he got from the Pharisees. The wisdom that he got from his old profession of religion. He, he kind of jettisoned all that. He pushed all that aside. Now he came not in the old wisdom of the old life. The worldly wisdom. He didn't bring that into his preaching. Why? Look at chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the carnally wise, the worldly wise, the philosophical, philosophically wise. It says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding 
of the prudence. And so he knew that was worthless. Worthless before the Lord. All those, all the wisdom, the carnal wisdom of the past, all that is thrown away. Where is the wise? Verse 20. Where is the scribe, the writer, the authors of those big volumes almost have an encyclopedia in recording the wisdom of those Old Testament people? Where is the disputer of this world, the debater of this world? Has not God made foolish? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? That wisdom did not get them saved. That wisdom did not make them righteous. That wisdom did not give them forgiveness of sin. That wisdom did not give them redemption because God made foolish the wisdom of this world. For after that, in the wisdom of God, verse 21, the world by wisdom knew not God. The world by their philosophies knew not God. The world by their literature knew not God. The world by their arguments, by their debates knew not God. It says it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. It says that's the wisdom that counts. When you abandon your own earthly wisdom, and when you look up to Christ who died for you on the cross of Calvary, and then you abandon everything you have read, everything you have heard from those philosophers, and you hear that Christ is the Savior by his crucifixion, by his sacrifice, he became your substitute. He became your sin bearer. He is now your savior. And you say, yes, Lord, I turn away from my sin and I embrace, I believe Jesus as my savior. That is wisdom higher than any other wisdom in the world. It has pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. It says in verse, in verse 22, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But Paul the Apostle said, Because he doesn't save, I throw that away. And he's counseling us. He's helping us, exhorting us. Whatever wisdom does not save, throw it away. Whatever tradition does not save, throw it away. Whatever ideology does not sanctify, throw that away. Whatever learning, whatever skill you've got that does not save, skill you've got that does not sanctify, whatever zeal, whatever you have that will not get you nearer to God and keep you in the pattern, in the purpose of God, throw it away. That's what Paul the Apostle did. And he said, now I preach the word. I act out the ministry. I do everything by the wisdom of God. The, full, the futility of worldly wisdom in preaching the gospel, in practicing the gospel, in performing the gospel, in doing anything that we do in the kingdom of God, the futility of worldly wisdom in our lives. Look at the second thing there. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, the second part of verse 4. It says, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, but in demonstration of the power of the Spirit. And that's what the Lord himself had promised us when he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And they were told in Mark chapter 16 verse 20, and they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord walking with them and confirming the word was signs following the Lord walking with them 
If you carry the wisdom of the world, the Lord will not walk with you. If you carry the tradition of the world, the Lord will not walk with you. If you carry the philosophies of the world as you are preaching, and instead of depending upon the Holy Spirit and depending upon the power of the Holy Ghost, if you depend on the principles and the proverbs of idol worshippers, and then that is your source of inspiration, the Lord will not work with you. And Paul the Apostle knew that. And so, if anybody is ministering to us, if anybody is trying to help us in the kingdom, in the ministry, in the church, if you discover that all that is, you know, projecting, all is carrying, all is practicing, is the wisdom of the world, say, this will not work. This will not get us into the kingdom. Let's all be like Paul the Apostle that will go in the demonstration of the power of the Spirit of God. It tells us in Romans chapter 15, looking at verse 18, Romans chapter 15, verse 18, for I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not wrought by me, to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. Through mighty signs and wonders, the sick were healed. Tradition cannot do that. The oppressed were delivered. Idolatry cannot do that. And then the people that even were insane and they had evil spirits, evil powers, all those evil powers were cast out in the name of Jesus and by the anointing of the Spirit of God. And Paul the Apostle knew you couldn't mix the principles of the world with the precepts of God and go with that kind of mixture and then demonstrate the power of God. He had to totally abandon everything of darkness and come in the power of the Spirit of God. That was how he ministered and that is how you are going to minister. I said that is how you are going to minister. All those things of the past that you knew in the white uh, garment, uh, you know, synagogues, and all the, you know, prophecy and all the speaking in tongues and all those uh, things that, you know, you carried on. And you were not born again at that time. And you knew that the Holy Ghost could not abide in a dirty vessel. You know that you were not saved at that time. How then can you come now into the kingdom of God? And now you are in the prayer warriors team. And then the way you used to pray when you were over there in darkness. And the names you used to call. And the names of angels. And the way you used to be emotional. And all that you bring that in. And then you sprinkle the name of Jesus on all those traditions. It will not work. It will not work. You'll destroy yourself. You'll destroy the people you're trying to pray for. You will abandon all the wisdom of the past. You'll abandon all the tradition of the past. You will abandon all those techniques of the past. And then you come now totally unto the Lord. Nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross. I clinch. And then you mention the name of Jesus. It will be mighty and powerful in your life in Jesus' name. First Corinthians chapter 2, I'm looking at verse 5. Our faith in the willingness and the purpose of God. Our faith in the willingness and the purpose of God. It says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Our faith should not stand in the shouting of a man. Our faith should not stand in the motion, in the demonstration, the way they walk up and walk down 
and the way they carry themselves and the way they box the air and the way they change their voice like the voice of a masquerade and the way they turn away from the natural to the hypersensitive pitch when they are trying to pray it says that your faith will not stand in the wisdom of man in the tradition of man in the methods of religious men but your faith will stand in the power of god and when your faith stands in the power of god the lord will answer your prayer look at the willingness of god that's where your faith should be second peter chapter 3 reading from verse 9 second peter chapter 3 verse 9 the lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but his long suffering towards word not willing that any shall perish not willing that any shall perish he doesn't want you to perish he wants to get to get saved he wants to forgive you let your faith be in that willingness of the lord he wills you to be saved you don't have to do any tradition or go to drink any water or go to drink any oil the oil will not change the mind of god the water the candle the white garment or whatever it is or the arm that you kill will not change the mind of god already he has given christ for your salvation and as you come and you say lord i have faith in your willingness your willingness to save me you are not willing that i should perish he is willing that you should be saved let your faith be in that willingness of god after you are saved he wants you sanctified he's the one that said be holy even as i am holy he wants you to have his nature it's not by crying by rolling on the ground by walking on pebbles by punishing yourself that you are going to be holy all that does not bring faith but you look at the promise of God, the, pro the precious promises of God. He wants you holy. He wants you sanctified. Come, lay everything on the altar and say, Lord, I surrender unto you. Sanctification will come. Give me a good amen. He wants you baptized in the Holy Ghost and Christ having ascended on high. I never received of the Father the gift of the Holy Ghost. He has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. He wants you baptized in the Holy Ghost. It's not by going to the mountain, that one doesn't change God. By going to the valley, that one doesn't change God. By going to a prayer mountain somewhere, that one doesn't change God. The promise is unto you and to your children and to many that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. If he has called you to salvation, you have responded. He has called you to sanctification. You have responded. He's now calling you to be filled, energized, and be loved by the power of the Holy Ghost. He will fill you to overflowing. Healing is promised already. By his tribes, we are healed. Everything that Christ ought to do, that we should be healed, that we should be delivered, everything has been done. It's not because, you know, you join this leaf or that leaf and with that concoction and then you pray on it. Blasphemy. Praying, putting the name of Jesus on concoction. Which one is healing you? Is it Christ or the concoction? But as you come and you understand, by his tribes, I am healed. He will heal you in Jesus' name. And the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but his long suffering towards words, 
not willing that any man, anyone should perish. I will not perish. I will not perish. You will not perish in Jesus' name. But that all should come to repentance. All come to repentance. He has power, and by that power, to set us free, make us free. The freedom is guaranteed in Jesus' name. First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, this one is not, is not praying with a kind of hypertension, a kind of stirred up blood. It's not praying with a kind of a ruinous emotion and a pitch in the voice. Just relax. And it says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved, reserved, tell me, reserved, tell me, if you're sure this is for you, tell me out aloud, in heaven for you. It's for you. And it's reserved for you. Your seat is reserved in heaven. Your place is reserved in heaven. When we come to pray, we're not boxing God. We're not trying to prevail on God. We're not trying to say, Oh God, you want to send me to hell? Don't you want me to get to heaven? That heaven, whether you like it or not, I must get there. Are you talking to God or talking to the devil? And what has the devil got to do in your praying time? Come to God and say, Lord, I know. You sent Jesus Christ to die for me. And he paid the full price. And I come to receive the salvation you have for me. The sanctification you have for me. The power of the Holy Ghost you have for me. I want to receive the grace to stand and the grace to abide and get to heaven eventually. Lord, I know you want me to get to heaven. And you have a place reserved for me in heaven. And you pray with confidence and with peace of mind, with assurance that God will do it. He will do it for you in Jesus' name. Look at verse 5, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God through faith. God will keep you. He'll keep you in salvation. Amen. He'll keep you in sanctification. He'll keep you in the power of the Holy Ghost. He opens the door before you, and no one will shut that door in Jesus' name. We are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Your revelation will come in Jesus' name. We come to point number three now, the depreciation of the hollow wisdom of the godless. The godless people, whatever their profession, whatever their status, whatever their station in life, whatever their school of thought, whatever their philosophy, whatever their religion, the godless, those who are not saved, they might talk or some job breaking vocabularies if they are godless their philosophies and their wisdom all those things are worthless the depreciation of the holy wisdom of the godless look at first corinthians chapter 2 reading from verse 6 the misery of the godless 
of the godless world in their glory. It says in verse 6, A bitch will speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the wisdom of the princes of this world that come to naught. The wisdom of the princes of this world that come to naught. They do not believe in Christ, the Christ of Calvary. The wisdom comes to naught. At the hour of death, the philosophies will fail them. When he crawls to the other side, in the presence of the eternal judge, their philosophies and traditions will fail them. When the hour comes that Satan is about to take their soul to a lost eternity, their tradition, their religion, their wisdom will fail them. The wisdom of the world that comes to naught. Look at verse 8. Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That's how far the wisdom led them. They couldn't discover by their wisdom that Jesus is the Son of God. They couldn't discover by their wisdom that the words of Jesus were not blasphemous, that the words of Jesus were truth and spirit, and that it is that word of Christ that brings life. They couldn't discover that, and so they said in their wisdom, traditional wisdom, philosophical wisdom, their Jewish wisdom, their Greek wisdom, their Gentile wisdom, they said, crucify him they crucified the Lord of glory because that is how far the wisdom could lead them the wisdom of the world will lead them into misery I pray that will not be yours in Jesus name number two the mystery of God's wisdom for our glory look at first Corinthians chapter 2 and in verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God. You can't hold both. You can't hold the wisdom of the world in one hand and the wisdom of God in the other hand. You can't have Satan and God in the same heart. You can't have the truth and error in the same heart. You cannot have the wisdom that is demonic and devilish in the heart and have the wisdom that is high and heavenly in the same heart. One has to go for the other. If you're going to have, if you're going to possess, if you're going to operate by the wisdom of God, you will erase, you will blot out all the other kind of wisdom. That's what Paul the Apostle did. That's why the power of God came to the zenith, came to the height in his life. And I pray that the power of God will fill you to overflowing in Jesus' name. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the wisdom, the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world for our glory. Number three, the marvels of the Lord's worthiness in glory i pray the marvels of the wisdom of god will be in your life in jesus name he's the lord of glory he'll be your lord i said he'll be your lord and glory will fill your life and the grace of god will fill your life and the goodness of god will fill your life in jesus name and look at verse 8 it says the hidden wisdom which none of the princes of this world knew, 
For at they known age, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And you will not crucify again the Lord of glory. Your life will not crucify the Lord of glory. The wisdom of the world will not occupy your heart, occupy your life to crucify the Lord of glory. You will not crucify again that Lord who has been crucified and who has given himself for you and who has provided everything at Calvary for you. You will not crucify the Lord of glory in Jesus' name. You know, there are people that do that. The false crucifixion, that only crucifixion is not enough for them. But now they want to crucify again the Son of God by their life, by their disposition, by the tradition, by the, by the rejection they have of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the demonstrations of what they do. They want to go back into the traditional wisdom, into the religious wisdom, into the occultic wisdom, and into the human wisdom, into the devilish wisdom. They want to operate the wisdom of the Bible and the wisdom of God is not enough for them and they want to go through that and they want to get that which is devilish again and when they do that they want to crucify the Lord of glory again it will not happen to you in Jesus name look at look at James chapter 3 in James chapter 3 let me show you the people that have the worldly wisdom the carnal wisdom the traditional wisdom the philosophical wisdom and they act like that although they read the bible they reject the wisdom of the bible look at the kind of wisdom they have it says in james chapter 3 verses 14 and 15 but if ye have bitter envy and strife in your hearts glory not and lie not against the truth this wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Wisdom of the world, wisdom of tradition, wisdom of old religion, the wisdom of the devil, earthly, sensual, devilish. What does that do? When people act in the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of Lucifer, the wisdom of Satan, the wisdom of tradition. You know what they do? Just like those other people did, in the wisdom of the world, they crucified the Lord of glory. Look at Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 6. It says, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves, they crucify to themselves, they crucify against their own progress, they crucify against their own salvation, they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. But Paul the Apostle said, I will not do that. I persecuted the church, but I've repented, I've turned. Now I come, and nothing of the old wisdom do I have, do I want, do I possess, do I desire. All I want now is the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God that gives us Christ that gives us salvation through the crucifixion, that gives us abiding grace, that gives us sanctification, that gives us the power, the power to live the victorious life, that gives us everything we need to have the grace sufficient and the grace abounding and the grace overflowing and the grace abundant to lead us to the kingdom of God. And he says, now when I come to the church, 
church and when I come to the ministry and when I come to the midst of the people of God I determine I make up my mind to know nothing among you apart from him Christ Jesus Christ and him crucified he has been crucified for you everything you need look at Calvary salvation look at Calvary sanctification look at Calvary healing look at Calvary the power of the Holy Ghost look at Calvary sustaining power look at Calvary abundant grace look at Calvary everything you need for today for tomorrow everything you need on it until eternity everything you need that God will keep you faithful until that glorious day everything has been provided on the cross of Calvary look up to him and in prayer you say I don't want to know anything I don't want to entertain any thought I don't want to entertain any idea except Christ and him crucified he will avail for you I said he will avail for you everything you need in the name of Jesus will be granted unto you in Jesus name why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, I come, I'm not coming in my own name. I come, I'm not coming in the name of tradition. I come, I'm not coming in the name of religion. I come, I'm not coming with the wisdom of the world. I come, I'm not coming with the wisdom of tradition. I come, I'm not coming with earthly wisdom, with sensual wisdom. I'm not coming with devilish wisdom. I come in the wisdom of the world of the almighty God I come in the finished work of, of Christ on the cross of Calvary he's done that for me he's done that for you and as you come in that name as you come with that assurance as you come with that faith everything you need that Calvary has paid for will be yours in Jesus name open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer let the word of God let the truth of God let the promises of God bear, bear fruit in your life everything you ask according to his promise everything you ask according to his provision everything you ask according to what Calvary has provided will be granted unto you don't come in your own strength don't come in your own name don't come in your own power don't come with tradition don't come with religion come in the name of the Lord and everything will be yours in Jesus name